Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this week's Game Video Com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. AMD have released information concerning their Rome range of processors. AMD have committed to an 40% IPC improvement over the FX range of processors. And when Ryzen finally launched in April of 2017, people were extremely happy to see that not only did AMD deliver on 40% IPC, but they actually managed to achieve over 50% IPC. And since then, AMD have been extremely aggressive with its strategy on processors, whether it's on the desktop side, whether it's on the portable mobility side, or of course on the server side. Just yesterday, there is a link in the video description if you want more information on this, but I covered the fact that Intel were concerned that they could lose up to 20% of the market share from AMD, which equates to about 4 billion US dollars. That's a lot of change to a company like AMD when Intel have just been crushing them over the past several years in the server industry. But recent reports from AMD, both at Computex and since, show that AMD are not going to be letting up the pressure on Intel anytime soon, particularly when it comes to Rome, which of course is the follow-up to the current Epic range of CPUs. AMD Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Data Center and Embedded Solutions, Forrest Norod, had reaffirmed that they were going to be bringing 7NM processors as scheduled into early 2019, and currently they were going to be conducting sampling in the second half of 2018. Don't forget, at Computex 2018, Lisa Tsu did actually show off the 7NM Rome CPU, and it was a thing of beauty. But here's the critical thing. On the one year anniversary, Forrester did confirm that we would be seeing major improvements across the board for Rome. Now, what we've learned, of course, over the past several weeks is this does include an increased core count. We're going to see 48 and then 64 cores from the Rome series processors, which is drastic. I mean, just think of it. That's just a single socket that can provide 128 threads. He also confirmed that Zen 4 and Zen 5 would be launching, but that would be after 2020. So yes, we've got a while to go before they're finally released. Meanwhile, the analyst firm Cohen has raised its projections for AMD share prices and is extremely optimistic. It's raised them from $18 to $21. And why is this? Well, it's not only Forrest's comments that I just mentioned a few moments ago, but analysts have dug a little deeper. Analyst Matthew Ramsey has said that we believe consistent product execution across the PC, uh, GPU and server roadmaps can deliver much higher gross profit margin targets, 40 to 44% versus 37 percent today and material upside is the 0.75 EPS target for 2020 outlined by management. Okay, so now I've just gone through a whole bunch of information concerning server processors, great, and share price information, the fact that AMD are going to be making more profits on CPU sold, all of that's fantastic stuff, but how does that benefit you as a gamer? I'm inclined to believe, based upon what Forrest is saying, what analysts are saying about the profit margins, that AMD may well actually increase the core count for the next series of mainstream Ryzen processors. Rumors that we've been hearing rather consistently is we're going to see the core count bumped to 12 to possibly even 16 cores for the equivalent of the Ryzen 7. Are AMD going to be doing this by increasing the number of CPU cores in a CCX, for example, bumping them to, let's say, six cores per CCX? Or are they going to be doing it simply by adding more CCX units into a processor? Well, we just don't know that, but it does appear to be AMD's strategy. AMD's strategy thus far has been very simple, an increased core count over its competitor. Now don't forget, Coffee Lake S is rumored to be shipping an eight core processor by the end of this year. The date's a bit ambiguous, but Intel certainly do seem to be pursuing it rather aggressively. Therefore, we can assume that by the time the mainstream 3000 series CPUs come along, in other words, Zen 2, AMD do not want to be once again, pitting an 8-core processor against Intel 8-core processor. Because even if AMD managed to have an equal level of performance on single thread versus Intel, Intel still are the bigger brand. What they want to do is to continue to wrestle market share. And AMD's strategy thus far has always been more cores, more cores. Plus, if you look at what they're doing with Threadripper 2, it's an awful lot of difference in the number of cores for the 
uh, HEDT market as well as the mainstream. Don't forget AMD are bumping the Threadripper core count up to 32 cores, 64 threads. So it does make sense for them to increase the CPU core count for Ryzen 7 3000. I also wanna go over a small update concerning the Radeon Pro v340 graphics card that i mentioned yesterday there has been new information including a full presentation which has emerged online now rather interestingly this did not actually happen during computex but since in a different presentation which happened in china rather weird but there we go it would appear that it is indeed a dual gpu design based upon vega it appears to be vega 10 and not vega 7 nm what's rather cool about this however is that it's going to have two gpus each having 16 gigabytes of HPM2 memory each, so a grand total of 32 gigabytes, and does support up to 32 users simultaneously. But crucially, AMD have managed to get support for industry standard applications, including Adobe Suite. If you've ever done video production before, for example, uh, the Adobe CC uh, Suite, if you've used Adobe Premiere, that type of thing, you'll know that a lot of folks will use NVIDIA graphics cards. It's pretty down standard. So for AMD to be supporting this and more importantly for software uh, studios to actually be embracing this standard is incredibly important and it will be very cool for AMD to be able to nab some of that market share from NVIDIA. I say that from the point of view that I want competition once again in the marketplace because it benefits all of us. If it brings down the price of the hardware, but perhaps more crucially, it also brings innovation. It brings the software studios to work to increase the level of performance. And of course, it increases the level of performance from the hardware manufacturers and the speed of hardware being released. And then all of that is good in my personal opinion. Video games are big business. Now I've given you that shocking revelation. Think of it this way, there are billions of people around the world right now who are playing video games. Think of it this way, Fortnite has 125 million players right now. That is a lot. That's about double the install base of the PlayStation 4. Just to put it into some level of perspective, it is astronomical. There are billions of players. And Microsoft know that they cannot hope ever to have billions of Xbox consoles out there. And they know that the widest platform they have to put games and their software in the hands of users is of course Windows itself. Unfortunately, it's fair to say that the company kind of forgot that. And for a long period, PC gaming and Microsoft were almost enemies of one another. As much as I'm sometimes critical about Valve, it's fair to say that Valve really held PC gaming down for a while. For uh, several years, it felt like Microsoft kind of forgot about it and they had these half-hearted attempts like Games for Windows Live that almost felt dirty. You also, you're almost like, oh, I really, I gotta deal with this? Oh no, it's horrible. Get it away from me. I'd say that our early work on games for Windows, Xbox Live stuff for Windows was well-intentioned, but anyone that's a PC gamer, and I play a lot of PC games myself, saw that as kind of an imposter console work coming over, and you can see some pe some of the people who are making decisions there, and some of our early efforts were more console to PC than respecting the PC audience and the things that they were looking for. And you've probably seen us slowing down on some of the progress that we've made on some of our apps and some of the other things because we are reworking on how we're thinking about the PC audience to try and be more reflective of the PC community that's out there. And instead of trying to pull people into things that come from the console space and try to get PC gamers more comfortable with that, we'll try to meet PC gamers where they are. Bill goes on to say that he wants to make the PC experience a more unique one. He wants the applications to feel more at home like the PC. And honestly, that's a great thing. As Phil himself says, they are the Windows company. Microsoft have been changing its strategy rather a lot recently, and it's a good thing. I have to say that their E3 conference that they put on was pretty darn awesome. And it wasn't just awesome because, okay, well, they've bought a few studios and okay, well, they've shown a few games and, you know, Gears of War 5 looked awesome and, you know, this looked great. Instead, it was more, I felt that what Phil had been saying for a long time was finally coming true. They were finally putting on display what they had been telling us that they were working towards, not just with the acquisition of five games developers, which is great, don't get me wrong. If you're a Xbox gamer or a PC gamer, 
That's great to know. You know, Microsoft have invested cash into studios like Ninja Fury, and they're saying that they're going to get to retain their creative freedom, which I'm going to take their word on that. But to me, it's not just that type of thing. It's also the fact that Phil himself was honest on stage, and he said that we are working on new Xbox consoles, codenamed Scarlet. I'll put a link in the video description if you want more information on that. It's clear that with the Game Pass and their decision to put games like the new Forza, Gears of War, Halo, all of those titles on the Game Pass Plus, and you know what I'm going to say, those titles are going to be appearing on PC. Finally, we're going to have a new Halo on the PC. Finally, we're going to have Gears of War 5 launching on PC, just like Gears of War 4, admittedly, but still, it's nice to know that that commitment remains in place. We're getting a Gears of War RTS on PC, oh my lord. We're getting a new Forza on PC. Basically, Microsoft appear to be finally taking the commitment to PC gaming seriously. And honestly, in my opinion, this is an awesome thing for the PC platform. I know sometimes Microsoft get flack for some of the things they've done for Windows and, you know, the whole privacy concerns of Windows 10 when it launched. And I was right along there with you. But I also do want to give them props for actually doing this. It's a great thing. DirectX 12 was sorely needed. The low-level APIs that we're seeing introduced recently, including, of course, Vulkan, have definitely changed PC gaming. Performance has gone up. Game engines are going to continue to evolve. Then we see Microsoft pushing ray tracing. Of course, they can't do it alone, and companies like AMD and NVIDIA and Software Studios as well are going to be part and parcel of this. After all, even if NVIDIA builds the best hardware and Microsoft builds the best operating system in the world, if no one uses it, it doesn't mean anything. So, of course, it's going to take a collaboration and for users to slowly buy that and adopt the hardware. But I think future of PC gaming is going to be very bright. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen over the next several years. What I hope, and I don't ever think it's going to happen at this rate, but I really hope that uh, Microsoft do get competition in the space when it comes to operating systems for PC gamers. Not necessarily because I think Microsoft are doing a bad job, but I want competition there because it continues to drive innovation. Unfortunately, the only company I can really see doing that, and I don't think Apple are going to be it, unfortunately, that would be great if Mac really pushed the gaming side, but it's just too expensive, and a lot of gamers just don't really have the mindset of doing that. They want the upgradability. So really, it comes down to Valve, and uh, yeah, SteamOS is just, well, it exists. I had so much hope for SteamOS and they just haven't fulfilled it, which is a real big shame. So maybe give Valve a kick up the butt. After all, it worked for Half-Life 3, right? Anyway, <laughs> hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.